morning. It's good to see everyone here on the Lord's Day. Uh, if I could kindly ask everyone to please stand for the reading of God's Word. And as you do so, and if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to thir- 13th chapter of the book of Psalm. Psalm 13 will be our scripture reading here this morning. As I read this, let us uh, once again re- be reminded that as I read this chapter, it's really nothing less than the very Lord here today reading and really speaking to you. So please give your undivided attention to what our Heavenly Father has to say to us, his children, his church this morning. Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. This is the reading of the word of the Lord. Please take your seats at this time. As we continue along in our series here in the book of Psalms, I have entitled, and I mentioned this before, that our series is called God's Songs for Our Souls. God's Songs for Our Souls. And what we're essentially doing is that we're trying to take one emotion or one experience week by week and asking the question, what does God want us to do with these experiences or emotions? So we're going to take one aspect of the human reality of life and look at the book of Psalm and say, what does this Psalm say or teach us or tell us to do with this particular emotion and experience? And so therefore, last week or two weeks ago, we looked at the experience of fear and we looked at what the Lord wanted us to do with our stress and our anxiety and our fears. And today, this morning in Psalm 13, we're going to ask the question, what does God want us to do with our discouragements? What do we want to do with our discouragements? What do you do when you're discouraged or slowly seeping into despair? Because that is something that is part and parcel to the reality of life, discouragements. Now, have you been discouraged before, recently, or even now? Actually, it's probably better to ask the question, when was the last time you were actually discouraged? When was the last time you sort of felt deflated? or defeated. You know, you meant well, you tried hard, you wanted to do something that was good, but for some reason or other, you felt discouraged, deflated. Discouragements are interesting because if I asked you to define discouragement, it's a lot harder to define discouragement, but much easier to feel discouragement. So if I asked you to define it, it would be much more difficult, but everyone knows what discouragement feels like. You know exactly what I'm talking about when I'm saying discouragement. It's interesting because not everyone can define it that precisely, but everyone knows exactly what I'm talking about. And at the same time, you know what it feels like when you're discouraged. You know what it feels like when you don't have much hope. That's why when you come into those moments, you'll say to yourself, I feel so discouraged. You don't necessarily think, I know discouragements. So you know the experience of it. You know what it feels like. And at any moment, you know that you could be discouraged. Anything can sort of set you off to be a little bit discouraged and frustrated, can it? Someone not showing up to an event you planned, someone not following through with a promise, someone just giving a passing comment that makes you sort of deflated and you meant well, but you just come away walking away discouraged. And so the question this morning for you is, what do you do about that? at work, at family, at church? What do you do with your discouragements? How does the Bible speak to this? How do you honor the Lord in your moments of despair? How do you persevere and continue along in life when every moment of your life seems to be a little bit of a discouragement? You know, the 19th century Scottish philosopher Thomas Carlyle said this, permanence, perseverance, and persistence in spite of all obstacles, discouragements, and impossibilities. That in all things distinguishes the strong soul from the weak. Permanence, perseverance, and persistence. In spite of all obstacles, discouragements, and impossibilities, he is saying that is the difference between a strong soul and a weak one. Do you want a strong soul here this morning? Do you want to be able to persevere and build a strong soul to persevere through the moments of discouragement? I think Psalm 13 gives you the answer here this morning. 
Psalm 13 is God's answer for your discouragements and despair. And this psalm is structured in a very simple and a clear manner because as one German scholar has said, the psalm consists of three groups of decreasing magnitude. In other words, he's saying this psalm here is like a cascading effect showing David's experience from deep sigh to calm prayer to joyful praise. And he continues, and this scholar says, this song, as it were, casts up constantly lessening waves until it becomes as the sea, when smooth as a mirror, the only motion discernible is that of a joyous ripple of calm repose. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying that this psalm shows David's experience moving from the big waves of despair to the smaller waves of prayer to the cool ripple, the calm ripple of praise. Do you want to be like that in the moments of discouragement? to slowly smooth out in praise and sing to the Lord, Psalm 13 shows us how. You want to have a strong soul like that? Psalm 13 tells us how. So I want to look at this psalm, according to this one scholar, in three cascading effects, three points to the message, and this is what we're going to look at. In verses 1 to 2, I want to consider David's despair, his discouragements. In verses 3 to 4, David's cry, his prayer. In verses 5 to 6, David's comfort. So it's very cleanly written out here. It's easy to teach, easy to preach, easy to follow. Two verses each for each point, three points, David's despair, David's cry, and then David's comfort. And then this will tell us what we do with our despairs before the Lord. So verses 1 to 2, David's despair. This is the first point. Now, one of the things you'll notice immediately through verses 1 to 2 as you read this is the repetition of how long. Now, you can read it for yourself. It's beautiful. And the Hebrew, actually, is very poetic. It's an alliterative, an alliteration. You know, it's very beautiful in some sense. The psalmist cries out, How long, O Lord? How long will you hide? How long must I take? How long shall my enemy? You know, it's just repetitious. How long, how long, how long, how long? That's what the psalmist is saying. And this is one way in which the psalmist, in which David, is expressing the depth of his discouragement and despair. How long? It's a signal. When you hear this, you're thinking, okay, something's not really good. You know, key phrases in everyday life really does that, doesn't it? You know, certain phrases will signal to you that something's not really right. You know, with Kathy and myself, you know, I know that I'm in trouble with her because she'll, have, she'll open up with the same phrase. It signals to me, okay, I need to stop looking on the computer, turn the TV off, I'm about to get in trouble. She'll always say this, Will, can I ask you a question? And every time I hear that phrase, Will, can I ask you a question? I'm like, oh, here we go again. What did I, what did I do wrong? Okay, something's wrong. It's signaling something bad to me. And the psalmist is doing the same way when he's saying how long. It's signaling to you that something's not right about the situation. And we do this in all kinds of everyday language, don't we? How long will prayer meeting be? How long is the wait at the restaurant? You know, a big one I get as a pastor of this church, and I say this graciously, people will come up to me during the holidays, how long will the joint service be? <laughs> They're not really looking forward to it to be honest. Not everyone, at least. They want to know the length of it. And in the same way David is expressing deep despair and discouragement, the words signal that to us. How long, how long, how long, how long? It's a moment of deep despair. See, friends, discouragement has to do simply with taking away someone's hope. That's what discouragement really means. That's why you take someone's courage away. That's why the word is discouragement. You've taken away someone's courage. Discourage comes from, really, etymologically, the French word décourage, dé meaning away, courage meaning courage, take courage away. That's what it's talking about. Discouragement, no longer having the confidence to continue along, no longer having the comfort, the courage to move forward in life. You're taking confidence and courage away. You know what? That's why it's the opposite of encourage. Courage that goes in, confidence that goes in. That's what David here is really expressing, discouragement. Courage has been taken out. And this is a little bit different, just so we could clarify the term. It's different from frustration. You know, certainly there may be an overlap between discouragement and frustration, but I want to clarify this so you can understand your life and your heart a little bit better. Frustration is a little bit colder. It's a little bit more impersonal, a little bit more, perhaps, circumstantial. That's what frustration really tells us. Discouragement is a little bit deeper, a little bit more personal. When you're discouraged, it hurts a little bit more. It's like the tank of your hope 
gets decreased a little bit more every time you're discouraged. A little bit more of hope is taken out of your tank of life. You know, so for example, imagine that I think to myself, you know, to be honest, I'll reveal a little bit, you know, I have certain anxieties and stress, and one of the anxieties I've had was actually doing a fundraiser for the mission trip that I didn't end up going on, but for Cambodia, and so we did shaved ice, and I'm so thankful and grateful to everyone in this church that has helped out. But part of me was stressed out because I was thinking, what if I show up on Sunday, and the nine other people that are supposed to help me out decided, Pastor Will, I don't trust your leadership, I don't believe in your plan, I'm going to bail on you, you're going to do it all by yourself. A hundred shaved eyes to make by myself. That's discouraging. It's personal. It hurts. It's a little bit deeper. But I try to do it anyways, and all of a sudden, I'm trying to make this shave ice, and there's no ice. The ice maker is broken. The water hose never really works. And I'm running out. The spoon kind of breaks. That's frustrating. You see the difference? Frustration is a little bit colder abstract. Discouragement is a little bit more personal. Frustration will lead you to anger. Discouragement will lead you to despair. No, continued discouragement and over and over again will slowly deplete your tank of hope. And when you reach the point where your tank of hope is completely empty and run out, you better get ready because at that moment, you've just entered into despair, the absence of all hope. That's where David is. It's not a frustration, it's a despair. It's not an anger, it's a discouragement. That's why he's crying out, how long, O Lord, will you forget me? Will you forget me forever? See, what's interesting about this, and this is really reflect upon your frustrations and despair, what's interesting about David's despair is that his biggest problem is not circumstantial, it's relational. Not circumstantial, not environmental, but relational. His biggest problem is not the environment that he's living in, although certainly that is stressful. His biggest problem is about the relationship before God he's living before. Do you see this? See, think about it. If I asked you, what are your discouragements in life, you'll write a list of all the things in your environment and circumstances, wouldn't you? Money is tight. My spouse doesn't listen to me. Children keep acting up. People at church don't respect me. Work is stressful. It's all about everything around you. But for David, his list of ultimately what dis discourages and causes his despair it's not a list about the things around him, although certainly that's legitimate. You can't negate that. His list of what causes discouragement is about his relationship with God. Not about a circumstance, but about the relationship. Friends, what I'm trying to say is this. The reason for David's despair is not the absence of answers. It's the absence of the Lord. That's why he says, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? This tells us, brothers and sisters, next time you're frustrated in life and constantly frustrated or discouraged or irritable, maybe the biggest problem you have in that moment is not about the people and circumstances around you, it's about something defective in your relationship with God before you. That's why he calls out, when will you turn around? See, some of you are thinking like this, that why would David even pray this? Because isn't God there? Isn't he omnipresent? Why would David talk like God's not around when we know God is everywhere at every moment in the fullest of his presence? At every piece of this earth, God is fully there with all his presence. That's a theological point to consider. But why would David say, God, why do you seem so far away? And the reason is because for David, God isn't literally far away. For David, God feels like he's far away. It's about his relationship. See, I had a friend back on the East Coast who was hanging out in the food court at the mall. Food court is one of my favorite places to eat, you know, fantastic place to eat. Uh, all kinds of varieties, great food at the mall especially. But anyways, he, he's telling me about this situation where he got into an argument with his wife, comes back, and he said, you know what, I got into a fight with my wife because I hung out with a bunch of friends yesterday. And I guess we didn't really clarify when I'm going to be back home. And so I ended up coming back at 2 a.m. My wife didn't know what time I was coming back. A little bit of miscommunication, a little bit of misunderstanding. And so he comes back into the bedroom. His wife is on the bed. And she's woke, she stayed up. She's angry. She's irate. As uh, my friend walks in, the wife says, you're back? And my friend said, yeah. And the wife just turned over on the bed and sat, slept on her side. My friend got into the bed, and he said, I felt so awkward. It's so uncomfortable, I couldn't sleep, my eyes were wide open because I felt so bad and she felt so far away. See, literally, they're only 12 inches apart on the same bed. 
but relationally, she felt so cold and so far away. David, when he cries out, is saying the same thing. God, you're always here, but something is wrong with the relationship here. You feel so far away. You feel so distant and cold. That is the ultimate source and reason for his despair and discouragement. And the point is essentially this. Maybe the reason that you're discouraged in life is not primarily because of things around you. Maybe the reason you're always discouraged in life is because of the relationship before you with God, that there's something defective, that there's something not exactly right. And so what do you do about that? Well, that leads us to point two in verses three to four. Well, this is what David does. He cries out to the Lord. He's saying, all these people around me, or whatever the circumstance is, is not right. God, my relationship with you is something lacking. This is what he does. He cries out in verses three to four. See, what do you do in your moments of despair and discouragement, naturally? Now you think about it. What do you do with your moments of discouragement? How do you think about your relationship with God in those moments when God seems so far away? Now, when I talk to people and I read about other people who go through discouragements, this is what usually they do. Now, usually, not comprehensively, but two big categories. One, some of you just make it about yourself. And you say, God feels so far away because I'm not really a loving person. I'm not that lovable. But others of you make it about God and say, well, God feels so far away because he's not that loving. So it's either I'm not that lovable or God's not that loving. And that certainly leads to defective theology that God is not loving and doesn't exist and whatnot. But the point is this. If you make your relationship or your discouragements and saying, God is far away because I'm not that lovable, I deserve this, that'll lead you to some sort of legalism or self-centrism. Because you're thinking to yourself, if God is not around, I must be a bad person and I deserve it. But if I feel that God is around, I must be a good person and I must have done something right. So that your relationship and your discouragements in life fluctuate with how good of a person that you think you are. But on the other hand, if you think, God feels so far away because he just doesn't care about my life, I'm telling you here that that is a recipe that will lead you into despair and even depression. That God is distant. He doesn't care. He's not involved in my life. David alludes to this in verse 3, and he says, Lest I sleep the sleep of death. God, if you don't answer my prayers, I may sleep the sleep of death. And according to one scholar, this possibly means depression or deep suffering. And David cries out, and he says, If you don't answer my prayer, I may become depressed. Now, for those of you, I don't doubt that some of you in this room may have battles of depression or struggling or maybe about to enter a depression. And so this psalm particularly should speak to you. Depression is the extreme version of despair, where everything is pointless and meaningless. Time seems to stand still. The 1600s, Robert Burton said this once, if there is a hell upon earth, it is to be found in the melancholy heart. If there is a hell upon earth, it is to be found in a melancholy heart. Ed Welch writes in his book that depression is not about pain. Depression is about meaningless pain. If the pain leads to childbirth, then it's hopeful and tolerable. If a pain leads to nothingness, blackness, and despair, it will lead to destruction. Some of you, even though a few of you maybe, somebody in this room I think is on that brink into destruction and despair. It's just the nature of the human discouragement and condition. So in those moments of despair, friends, and discouragement, it's not that you're unlovable. It's not that God doesn't care as unloving. What David tells us to do, what the Bible is saying, in your moments of discouragement, cry your discouragements to God. Pray them to God. Let God know how you feel. See, specifically, David prays for three things in verse 3. He says, look, answer, and give. That's what he prays in your moments of discouragement. Next time you're discouraged, if you feel that life seems hopeless, where am I going to turn? You feel that life is bleak and black, look at verse 3 and try to pray that as well. Consider and answer me, O Lord, my God. Light up my eyes, lest I give the sleep of death. Lest I sleep the sleep of death. He essentially is praying, look at me, God. Answer me, God. And give me light, God. The problem, you see, friends, is that as David prays, he's not praying to God to fix his circumstances. He's praying for God to give more of himself. 
That's the solution to your discouragements, not for a solution around you, but for God to give more of himself to you. That's why the problem, verses 1 and 2, is not circumstantial but relational. David is asking for an enduring hope, but he does so not by asking for God to fix his problems, but for God to restore his favor upon him. That's why he says, God, look at me. Our translation says consider. It means look, face me, look at me, give me your attention. Would you answer my cry? Would you light up my eyes? Would you help me to light up? So I love that phrase here where it says, light up my eyes. It's fantastic. You know, I read this article about this one track coach of the University of Oregon. His name is William J. Bowerman. He was a, a coach for over 20 years at the University of Oregon. He eventually partnered with a friend of his, I think Phil McKnight or Phil Knight or something like that. They co-founded this small company called Nike. And in this company, in this article that was written by William J. Bowerman, the author said this, every morning, William J. Bowerman woke up, and it seemed as if he woke up with new eyes, with fresh eyes upon life. And David essentially is asking for the same thing. Look at me, answer me, God, light up my eyes. Restore your favor so that I may have fresh eyes in life. And this is an interesting point because what David is saying is that the effect of God's blessing would make your faces light up. People relieved from troubles and stress, blessed with God's protection and peace and favor, will show their inner spiritual condition. As one commentator said, people who have the blessing and presence of their Lord, their eyes will sparkle with the grace of God. Their eyes will have a twinkle that shows there's something more to life. And I pray that all of us, our eyes would sparkle with the grace of the Lord, that all of our facial expressions would sparkle with something that's greater than this world. One commentator in this footnote said this, that essentially David is asking for God's presence to come back. It is as if there is a glazing over gradually over his eyes so that his face begins to light up with the life of God. See, you want, let me try to explain what David's experience is like this right here. Maybe it won't resonate with Californians. You know, if you ever experienced snow or just a continual rain, that's David's experience. If you ever went days and days where it's just gloomy and dark and rain is pouring down or it's just cold and bitter and snow for weeks on end without any glimmer of hope, that sort of stale feeling, that sort of sense of Man, this is really gloomy. That is the condition of David. And when David is saying, God, look, answer, and give me light, he's saying, would you melt this winter away? Would the, sh the sun shine through the clouds and cause the rain to stop? That is what David is praying for. David is a walking example of what John says. We are to walk in the light as God is light, and we will be light. So friends, this morning, if you are in the winters of your life, if you are in the rain season of your life, if you are suffering emotional or psychological pain of any sort, and you're about to seep into something deep like depression, would you look at verse 3? Would you pray that into your heart and your life and say to God, my biggest problem is not the circumstances around me, but something defective about my relationship before me? Would you ask God to look at me, to answer me? Lord, would you light up my eyes so that every morning I could wake up with new eyes? That the grace of the Lord will cause a twinkle in my eye. That there's something greater and bigger than myself. And if you do, you will receive, you will be like David in verse 5 through 6 and point number 3, you will have a peace and a comfort that you'll never have experienced before. See, in verses 5 to 6, this is what David says. He cries out, he despairs in verses 1 to 2. He cries out and he prays in verses four, 3 to 4. And David share, here shows you the result of his prayer. So you think about it for a second. Verses 1 to 2 is almost like a different person from 5 to 6. You know, 1 to 2 is somebody who's stressed and depressed and in despair. How long, how long? How long, how long? Verses 5 to 6 is like a different person, isn't it? My heart will rejoice. I will sing to you because you have dealt bountifully with me. That's what he says in verses 5 to 6. That's like a different person. How do you get from verses 1 to 2? From 1 to 2 to 5 to 6? Well, it's the prayer that I just said in verses 3 to 4. 
Do you feel like how long, how, is that your life? Do you want to be peaceful? Do you want to trust in the steadfast love of the Lord? Does your heart want to rejoice in the salvation? Do you want to be a person who can sing to the Lord and know that in the midst of suffering, the Lord has still dealt bountifully with you? It's the prayer of verses 3 to 4. If you pray 3 to 4, you will be like 5 and 6. And this is what 5 to 6 says. It's David's comfort. I find it interesting that David becomes like this in 5 to 6, singing, rejoicing, trusting, even when nothing in his circumstances has changed. See, David never received an answer to his question verse 1 and 2. How long, how long, how long? God didn't say, well, in two years, two weeks, one day, 13 hours, 56 minutes, 10 seconds, then he'll be done. David never receives an answer because the answer is not really about quantity of time. It's about a relationship and the quality of God. That's what he's really struggling with. He never receives an answer to his problems. He never has his circumstances fixed. When David receives and trusts and rejoices, the only thing different is that God has given more of himself. It's a relationship before the Lord that David has cultivated. That's the biggest problem many of us. Do you feel this morning, you ask yourself, why do I come to church week in and week out, and I don't really feel excited or passionate or have a zeal for the Lord. Why is it that certain churches are so good at teaching and preaching and whatnot, but I don't feel anything? My question to you is, like, when's the last time you cultivated your relationship with God? Through prayer. When's the last time you pray to God? If you never talk to God, how do you expect to feel passion for God? See, as one pastor, I think it was Brian Chappell, who said it this way, a lot of Christians are more cerebral, so they approach God and Christianity like mathematics or physics. When in reality, Christians need to approach God like chemistry, like a relationship with butterflies in your stomach. You want to get like that? You want this peace? You want to rejoice? These are very emotional words. You want to trust? You got to pray verses 3 to 4. And when you do, you'll have this comfort in 5 to 6. We're never told exactly what David is going through. And I think the author did this because he wants everybody to relate to David. He doesn't say David is king, that's why he's stressed. David is a leader, that's why he's stressed. David has people coming after him, that's why he's stressed. We don't know why David is so distressed and discouraged and in despair. It's left ambiguous because everyone who reads this can therefore identify with this discouragement and despair. You can relate to it. Life is hard, friends. Life is difficult. See, I get a question like this almost monthly. Ministry must be hard, Pastor Will. I really pray for you. I'm so, I'm, I, ministry must be hard, isn't it? It must be hard for you. And I'm so thankful that they're very compassionate. But in some sense, I think that sometimes pastors or whatever it may be think that ministry is a special group where we suffer and we struggle and it's harder than anything else in this world. And ministry is hard. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, I get discouraged. But it's not as if ministry is in this special elite group that suffers or is discouraged more than anyone else. Ministry is discouraging because life is discouraging. Being a single mom could be discouraging. It could be hard. Working 70 weeks in construction could be hard. Life is discouraging and hard. The psalmist understands this, and he says, I'm not going to give you details about David's discouragement, because when you read this, everyone can relate to the despair and the sigh. How long, O Lord, will my life be like this? Everyone can relate to this. But everyone at the same time is called to dwell with the Lord in his presence and to love him and to rejoice in him. Friends, what I'm saying is this, that the secret to trusting in the Lord, to rejoicing in him, is not to have your problems in life fixed, although that's important, but it's to turn and trust in the Lord and to know God better. That is David's solution. He says, I'll trust in the salvation of the Lord. That's what he says in verse 5 but I have trusted in your steadfast love. It's emphatic, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. Now, do you trust the Lord here this morning? Do you ever consider the reason why you're so discouraged is because you don't really trust the Lord? I, I recently was watching a clip from Aladdin uh, on YouTube. It just kind of popped up. I don't know why I was watching it, but there's a great line. You remember the story, don't you, Aladdin? First meets Jasmine in the beginning of the movie. They're running away from these guys that are trying to take him. Aladdin goes to Jasmine, turns to her, do you trust me? She hesitantly reaches out, grabs his hand, and they jump down. Later on in the movie, when Aladdin comes up as a prince, he's on the flying carpet, wants to go on this scary, crazy ride in the sky, he turns to Jasmine again, do you trust me? 
She reaches out and grabs his hand. Why does Jasmine trust Aladdin? Because on some level, she trusts his character and his ability. That's why she'll jump down floors away from people that are trying to get her. That's why she'll go on a flying carpet that flies across the world because he trusts, she trusts in the ability and the character of Aladdin. Now, I'm pushing this analogy pretty far, but in the same way, that's what really David is saying. In the midst of the most difficult circumstances, do you trust in the ability and the character of God? Because if you do, you will be at peace no matter what the circumstances will be. Sure, you could be discouraged. Sure, you could be worried. Sure, you could go through despair. But in the end, you will find peace. You will find peace comfort when your relationship with God is cultivated so you trust in the ability and the character of the Lord. See, David's experience has come full circle from God's silence to God's light to God's salvation. And his only response at this moment, even though nothing around him has changed, was simply to worship and to sing to the Lord because he says, the Lord has dealt bountifully with me. As the author Evelyn Underhill once said, if God were small enough to be understood, he would not be big enough to be worshipped. And so that's what we got to consider. See, David's heart rejoices in salvation. And the real crux for us here today in which we could trust in the Lord, the real reason we could look to the Lord and have him answer us is because God has looked upon us. It's because God has answered us. It's because God has lit our faces up. Well, how did he do this? By sending his son, Jesus Christ. Don't you understand? Do you see this? See, Jesus Christ is the one who is able to do something that we couldn't do. On the cross when Jesus died, he faced the abandonment in which David experienced in verses 1 to 2. The difference was when David experienced the abandonment of God, God came back. When Jesus experienced the abandonment of God upon the cross, God turned his back. And Jesus was able to persevere. He was able to do what you couldn't. You can't face the abandonment of God by yourself. Jesus did it for you. And then he gives himself to you so that therefore you can have a peace and a prosperity. Therefore you could persevere through your discouragements. Jesus is the one in whom God accomplishes the salvation of verse 6. That's what we're able to sing. How will God save people in this world? David doesn't know the clear answer, but we do. God accomplished salvation because he sent his one and only begotten son to die upon the cross to redeem a people for himself. That's why when we sing to the Lord, we in a much fuller and clearer sense may sing to Jesus Christ. When David prays, look at me, God said, I'm going to send my son in human flesh to look upon you. When David says, answer me in my problems, God said, I'm going to answer you in a way that you never imagined. I'm going to send my son Jesus to die for you and to redeem you so that you will be in a perfect relationship with me. And when Jesus, Jesus says, would you light up my eyes? God said, I will light up your eyes by giving you the light of the world, Jesus Christ, in his revelation, in his glory for you. So friends, if you're discouraged here this morning, my encouragement to you is to look to Jesus Christ, the answer for your salvation, the light of the world for you. He has restored your relationship with God. He has filled you in your heart with his presence. And if you're on the verge of despair, if you are that gloomy season of rain or snow, realize that upon the cross, Jesus has sent forth the sun in a bright shining glory to comfort you and give you peace. Look to Jesus Christ here this morning. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much that you have not left us to ourselves. And Lord, there may be many people here this morning that are not discouraged, and I thank you for that. We thank you who are not in the moment of despair, who are rejoicing, thankful, worshipful. We thank you so much for that grace, but we also lift up whoever in this room consistently seems to be discouraged at work or church and life, who is on the verge of despair because their tank of hope is being depleted. We pray, Lord, that you would instill within their hearts nothing less than the gospel of Jesus Christ, your plan of salvation, the answer to David's prayer in verse 3, that you will light their eyes up with the light of the world in Jesus. We thank you, and we pray all this in his name. Amen.